Welcome to Discovery Indie Film. I'm your host, Jeff Howard, and I've got filmmaker Bern Owens with me. Hey, Bern. Hey. All right, so we just recorded a nice, long interview all about Bern, his history, his uh, TV series or your web series on YouTube called My Roommate The, everything that led up to My Roommate The Jedi, which was at the Sherman Oaks Film Festival in 2021, which if you're listening to this, you should know I'm the head programmer of that festival. And I'll just add that my roommate, the Jedi, took home five awards from that festival, which might be a record. I'm not, I'm not trying to blow smoke towards your ass, but I know of like films that won three and four. I'm not sure I can name one that won five. And I'm gonna rattle them off. The Grand Jury Prize for Best Short Film Sci-Fi, Audience Award for Best Short Film Sci-Fi, Filmmakers Awards, and that's the one giving out, given out by a, a jury of your peers, of other filmmakers who've had films at the festival. They gave you Outstanding Director for Sci-Fi. They gave you Outstanding Screenplay for Sci-Fi. And of course, you directed and wrote those. Your name's on there. And then Outstanding Performance by a Cast for Sci-Fi. So there you go. Five motherfucking awards at one little festival. Damn. Feels good. And, Thank you. And, uh... That is the introduction, besides the fact that I'll add that you should watch My Roommate the Jedi as soon as you can by going to Amazon Prime Video, type in Discover Indie Film, go to season six. I'm pretty sure it's, now I'm thinking it's episode five, but uh, by the way, it's a fucking brilliant episode because there's three films in it, and it starts with Of Crumbs and Dreams, which is... I think it's about a, two minutes, but it's an animated film about an ant who uh, fights the powers that be, uh, which it would, I guess would be the queen ant. And then right in the middle is is a rad little lo-fi sci-fi film called EP that's actually like the pilot episode of a web series that just like you, this guy came up with the film and he did the whole damn thing himself, like learned how to animate it, did a cool process. That's rad. And then the third film in that episode is My Roommate the Jedi. So you actually get three motherfucking great movies. Movies, yeah. For the for, for 99 cents, or you could be really smart and spend 7.99 on all of season six and enjoy all 20 films. I can promise you they're great. And if you don't like it, Yell at me on social media. Come at me. Come at me. Troll me. I'm, I'm game. So, that's the introduction. Now, we're not going to talk about Burns film, his history, all that stuff. We're going to talk about movies. And he's going to answer the Discover Indie Film 4 questions, which are favorite films of all time, an underrated film, an overrated film, and a lesser known film that people should seek out. My intro was three minutes and 15 seconds. Now I'm shutting up. You can actually start with any question you want, but we normally start with favorites. Uh, you know, I think just because I, I kind of answered them backwards in my head just now, um, I think the lesser known film that I, a lot of people should see that was kind of like a, uh, an intro for me into just really good storytelling um, was Waking Life. Um, by yeah, Link, Link, Ladder. Link Ladder. Yeah, and it's an unconventional film because it's it's a series of interviews, and sometimes you can't tell whether it's scripted or whether it's just people talking. Um, and and you know it, it kind of comes off almost like a documentary where people are talking about dreams and these kind of esoteric ideas around like how we weave stories in our minds and what is re- what is reality. Um, anyway, I find that find that story beautiful, and I always try to share it with anybody that's into film. Um, I think that a film that is uh, highly underrated and uh, often debated whenever I bring it up is Meet Joe Black. Um, this is a film that um, has it has its flaws. I think there's a lot of criticism around the main actress's performance um, next to Brad Pitt, but uh, it was based off of a play. And it has uh, a really beautiful score that accompanies these scenes that are just actors standing across from one another and having these really powerful emotional moments. And uh, that that film just it really touched me. Um, and um, I yeah I I think it deserves more credit than it got at least at the time of its release. I've heard that 
I've heard that. I think someone else who's been on this podcast has has mentioned Meet Joe Black that way, and I actually hadn't heard that because that's Claire Forlani, right? And yeah, I think she's excellent. I, she's, I love her. Yeah, she's one of those actors who I think her career should be ten times what it is. Agreed. And I actually kind of assume, I assume her problem was that she wouldn't play the Hollywood game the way. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's no there's no explaining why she's not a superstar. I don't think it seemed like she could have just named her named her next role after that movie. Um, I was just one of the most powerful kind of romantic films. I mean that I, I'm going to put that in a close close uh, tie with um, Waking Light. Or I'm sorry, um, What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams. But see that one's a hard one to rewatch because it's a tearjerker. I mean it's gut wrenching. And then especially now with Robin Williams, uh, you know, having um, having died the way that he did. But um, that that movie, I mean, it just encapsulates uh, love and death and letting go. And, and I think both that and Meet Joe Black for me just it did something for me emotionally uh, that it's almost like therapy. I, I can't explain it. Um, or I can try, but check check those out. Uh, a movie that is uh, overrated. Um you know, let me come back to that because there's just like a bunch of movies that's just kind of sure. like extreme. And down. I'll, I'll I'll add a thought, which is you're not saying that it's bad. You could actually love this film, sure, but it just got a little bit more. But it gets bit. more. You know, it could even be. You know, mine is sometimes like I won't give it away, but but like there's Coen Brothers films that have won Best Picture that I don't think are the best they've done. Sure. And yeah. so like to me, like well, how come they win the award for that one? And then the superior films didn't even get nominated. Like that's, that makes that overrated to me, even though I think it's brilliant. It's just, you know, the wrong thing is being acknowledged. For yeah. Me. yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. But I it's agree. not necessarily a shit on a film mm-hmm. question. Although you can absolutely, you are free well, to shit you know on what? anything no, you want. No, 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 no. I, I get you. I, I think there, there is a use for that. Uh, for that question that can really spark something. And I, so I'm going to come back to it. Cool. Um, I think my all time favorite film that I think is just absolutely perfect in terms of screenwriting, performing music, everything uh, is uh, Shawshank Redemption. Um, I even used it as a metaphor in describing how I felt when I was uh, editing uh, my roommate, the Jedi, there was this sense that I was in a prison cell and I was digging my way out with a spoon with the resources that I had. And, um, and there was actually even no real guarantee that I was going to get out. Uh, and I st- still think of it as like that as a metaphor for me and my career in the entertainment industry. And that like, you know, I-, I love the opportunity that I have and the job that I have. But there's just so much about Shawshank that just like speaks to it. it- it's so metaphorical and symbolic and also just the unfairness that the that the villain has over him um, and the selfishness and the jealousy and the envy and like all the characters that he's around and his choice to still be a leader in spite of that, his choice to still try and find the good in all of it, to try and talk the guard into giving everybody beer uh, in an afternoon, like his his just constant trying to enhance his life and enjoy it in spite of everything is just a really beautiful story to me. Um, and I, every time I watch it, I really do almost try to find like, is there a scene in this? That it just doesn't resonate. That just felt like it, I, they could have cut it. And I, I can't, I can't find that with it. Um, it's kind of like the way Casablanca is perfect, which I would agree is, but it's just so at this point dated that you could just look at it as like an artifact. That's like, this was, this set the stage for what a perfect film should be and is arguably the perfect film, but just is such, is such a format. That's like a play, um, that I, 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 yeah, Shawshank is what I just always point to and say, if you have not seen this movie, please. And if you love movies, watch it. Um, just outstanding. Um, so, uh, and you're allowed two more if you want. Two more. Uh, you can you can name three favorites, and you can name oh, more oh, if you oh, want. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Okay, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Braveheart. Um, Braveheart to me is one of the uh, just like the best historical action dramas 
um, that to me just really echoes what the Middle Ages and medieval times were and how horrific things were and how how bleak it all seemed, um, as well as just the the idea of like what what rage uh, can can do uh, for an entire nation. And, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back in spite of a king that is absolutely uh, a monster of a, of a being, like in terms of his intelligence and ability to, to win wars um, and how his downfall came from, uh, you know, the love of a, of, of a princess that he just disregarded and didn't really, you know, think it, it's like all of those elements. I, I really it's for as much, uh, you know, heat as as Mel Gibson has brought down on himself. Uh, I I really felt like that was, and also just as a filmmaker, seeing this actor come out and do that and be like, all right, I'm going to act in it. It's not going to be a comedy. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be, I'm going to be full blown out there fighting. um, And I'm going to direct this thing and I'm going to direct it the way I wanted it to be directed. I mean, it's just so masterful. Um, And then I would say the other one is Terminator 2. Uh, Terminator 2 is just God, it's flawless. Like, I mean, it just, what the heck am I? And I saw it at a young age. It, it like broke my brain. It just was, it, it leveled up Hollywood in such a way. And I still think, I mean, you can watch that thing. And even just the T-1000 scenes, like, aren't that dated. Like, they don't look bad. None of it. Uh, none of it's dated. And it's such good storytelling. Yeah. I think Cameron never gets the respect he deserves as a writer. Because I think that guy's one of the best writers there is. I agree. Yeah. He, he really is. I get it. I get people. You need to shit on the guy who's made a cup, the first couple of films that broke a billion. <laughs> but, and that, that film is, is special as hell. And, and talk about, you know, if you listen to the previous podcast, you'll know that Bern and I both, you know, bemoaned how Star Wars went wrong. And, you know, the first Terminator film was his baby. And then he got to make a sequel and he took it a step further and better in every way. Like, has there ever been a sequel that was that superior to the first? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it. And what's so funny is because it echoes so much of what the first one did. It kind of retells it. But like in this really cool, like, well, that's how time works. Like, that's what time travel is. And and that's what. You know that's what what that's what fate means, and you know all all this great uh, uh, symbolism underneath uh, underneath it all, and then the humanity of the Terminator, and how like you know is does AI bring down itself? Like, are, should we really actually be afraid of AI? Is it eventually just going to defeat itself because it finds humanity within itself? I mean, yeah, there's just all of those pieces, and then just like his his attention to detail and all of his action and and. How, how well paced it is like god good just good for him and and um i know that the world kind of sees him as like the steve jobs of of filmmaking and i'm sure he is to a degree and i'd like to think that i, I could get to where he is with his enthusiasm but not be an asshole when i get there um but then it's like i don't know like but he's he's driving this thing that is meant to be that it's supposed to hit all of these marks. We'll see what happens with Avatar. I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, me too. I and I'm now I'm going to sound like an even bigger Cameron apologist. But in spite of all the asshole reputation, the asshole reputation, my understanding is that most of his crew has been with him for 30 years. Yeah, you know, if you don't, if you do a good job, and if you bring something to the work I think he respects everyone I believe it and and I just think it's you know if someone fucks shit up he can't handle it but you know Sigourney Weaver doesn't take shit from anyone and she keeps working with him yeah and not to mention all the crew so so yeah I find it I I you know I'm 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 hopeful that Avatar doesn't let me down I thought the first Avatar was great so yeah I did too yeah yeah uh, I think the 3D was was a bit tough uh, on the eyes, but oh, but you know the, what? I I never saw it on in 3D. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. Oh, maybe, no, of course I did. Course it, had, I did. it had some really great 3D moments, but I think um, I think I wish I I'd, I'd seen it just on a regular screen. 
it I mean it's it's a good story. Like and I know it's you know, it's Fern Gully, it's Last of the Mohicans, it's Last Samurai, but I, I have uh, my cheeky comeback to everyone who says it's 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 Pocahontas. Oh, Pocahontas, yeah, Blue Pocahontas. I go, yeah, because yeah, remember how Pocahontas was about a quadriplegic or a paraplegic soldier who gets to live again through virtual reality? Yeah, that was in Pocahontas, right? Like, there's a lot of original shit in that film. I don't, I don't have a problem <laughs> with. I honestly don't have a problem with people retelling. There's a there's formulas, right? Uh, my my wife, she is she loves these uh, period piece dramas of like the Victorian era and like, and it's kind of the same story. It's like a love triangle. Like love stories tend to just pull from like five or six different like dances, right? There's like the 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 two lovers. There's the uh, you know the forbidden love. There's the uh, unrequited. I mean, yeah. there's like you 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 can go, but if you criticize the, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just, we have characters that are going through the human dance. And one of them includes, I'm going to fall into this tribe and I'm going to realize that I should have, that I, that I was on the wrong side the whole time. Like that's, that's a great story. And I hope they keep telling it for all the filmmakers out there listening. Um, Okay. Let's go back to overrated. And I'm going to, I think, I think that uh, Tenet needs to be talked about more because I really want to believe that thing is brilliant, but I cannot for the life of me find it. And that's aside from the fact that I can't understand a single thing that's being said and I really need to rely on subtitles. But I just felt like Christopher Nolan, he maybe he needs his brother back. Like maybe he needs to be reined in I'm curious to see what happens with Oppenheimer. I'm sure it'll be amazing. I'm sure it'll be great. But it's just like I was really looking forward to Tenet, and I think and I think COVID kind of screwed that up a bit. But it would just it got it got a lot of hype and it got a lot of love from um, from Nolan fans. And I think that if if there wasn't you know all of these great Nolan movies leading up to it, I just don't think it would have. I just don't think it would have. Uh, done well at all <laughs> i i can't respond because i'm i'm one of those people who i kind of consider myself a nolan fan i love a lot of the yeah a lot of it intensely and i've never sat down to watch tenant i've actually had a screener of tenant from when it was first up for awards or whatever and and you know i can't convince my wife i'm like do you want to watch the film that everyone says is kind of disappointing like, yeah like it's just not a in this era of of billions of films to watch every night and TV series to binge every night. Like, how am I going to sell her on? Let's, let's sit down and let's, let's make ourselves watch Tenet finally. Like it's time, it's time to watch Tenet. Like I just, I want to be confused and not get it. And maybe, maybe I will get it. Maybe we'll read up on it. I don't know. But yeah, I have not been able to make myself watch it. I'll have to watch it alone, I guess. Cause I can't torture her with it. It's not completely absurd. Like it's not so unintelligible that you're just going, what, what am I, what am I watching? It's not, it's not that it's actually, that's, I think that's what's frustrating is that there's just enough to be like, God, is this brilliant? Am I stupid? What? Like, yeah. Fire your sound guy. Fine. Let's, can we just like, let's shelve that problem that it happened, but and and I think Nolan actually has a problem with his sound people because, or he maybe he has a sound issue because I, I would say all of his films suffer from a little too much. Uh, as I as I move away from the mic, a lot of too much, uh, you know, loud music and explosions and dialogue just being like really really low. But Tenet does this thing without. You know, I'm not gonna spoil it or anything, but it does this thing where it like connects timelines in a way that says, okay, they definitely thought about every single story point and how that story point connected to another piece of the story. And I think there was a lot of thought that was put into this, a lot of production value. The actors seemed to understand what they were doing and where it was going. 
So all of that was there. But I mean, I understood Inception and I defend it to people that are like, that made no sense and it was stupid. And I go, it made so much sense. And it helped paint such a beautiful picture about the way we consider dreams. And I consider Inception a a brilliant film. I love, I love Inception. And when you were describing how everything went together, that's, that's his talent, right? Like Inception, everything works. Everything works at every level of reality, every level of dream reality, I guess. Yeah, it's so, so well thought out. I bet you are right about the brother thing. Because, and maybe they're both suffering without each other because, yeah, we, the first season of Westworld was pretty brilliant. And then it kind of like gets off course, I think. So, yeah, maybe they, we should just force them to like, come on, just, you're, you're better together. Like, you know. Was there a solo album from John or Paul that was as good as a Beatles album? Not really. Like some some partnerships were meant to be. Yeah, I agree. That's maybe may, I don't know, and I don't know if uh, if they if if Oppenheimer is totally Nolan, uh, Chris. Maybe maybe the brothers did get 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 back together for that one. I don't know. Um, I don't um, know. A Google search will will tell me after after this call, but. Um, yeah, those those are my films, at least in, in terms of what I can speak to. And I think uh, defending some of your previous guests that may have given more, I, I think there are plenty more that are just not jumping to mind right away. But will probably in thirty minutes, I'll be like, oh, this, oh, I, why didn't I mention that? You know. But well, yeah, but you not, not only that, but you have a nice uh, nice balance because Shawshank, Braveheart, T two, you know, you got you got your 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 historical drama which is honestly a, a brilliant brilliant film and and then Shawshank forget about it like Shawshank is a is a is a perfect perfect work and then T2 is a wonderful thing to throw in cuz also for watchability like the question is favorite it's not best films right. ever made it's favorites yes. you know yes and uh what can i say good list fun list i'm going to get us out of here by the way, if you go to the show notes of this on whatever podcatcher you you are using, uh, Burn Owens, I'll put his his website and social media handles on there with links, so you can you can find out more about him and the films he's made and uh, the YouTube series he made, My Roommate The. So you know that I said in the intro about watching My Roommate The Jedi the quintuple award winner is that the right way to say it five time award winner at Sherman Oaks Film Festival last year and it's now on Amazon Prime Video so just go to Prime Video type in Discover Indie Film and enjoy season six Uh, go to discoveryindiefilm.com for more info about this podcast or that series and it's at DIF wins on social media I'll quickly name the film festivals there's Sherman Oaks Film Festival every November Learn more at ShermanOaksFF.com and it's at ShermanOaksFF on social media. And finally, FilmVasionLA.com, the sister festival. You know, when we were starting the festivals, sometimes I share this, that we just couldn't come up with a name. We didn't know if we wanted to name it after a location or name it after LA. So one morning in the shower, as we were like starting this, this uh, venture, I was like, let's try both two names and see which name works. And they ended up Film Invasion LA draws more stuff from like Europe and Asia because it's got LA in the name. Sherman Oaks gets wonderful support locally. So, and they're both ranked in the top 100 best reviewed, knock on wood. So, anyway, Film Invasion LA.com, at Film Invasion LA on social media. And, uh, Burn Owens, thank you so much for coming in and talking film for, for a good while. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Hey, it's Jeff. I'm back for an addendum. I am sorry to say that my roommate, the Jedi, didn't go over so well with the powers that be at Amazon. They let us know that it felt a bit like trademark infringement to them, or they didn't use that term. They actually just sent us a thing saying it might mislead audiences. It seems pretty clear to me that it's fair use and that the Star Wars brand and George Lucas himself always encouraged fan films. But, you know, 
it's their platform and my room at the jedi is no longer a part of the discover indie film tv series my apologies but you can still catch it on youtube just go to youtube and type in my roommate the or my roommate the jedi and enjoy the shit out of that wonderful film all right now the podcast is over yeah.